Today's sermon is Before You See Death, See Christ. Before You See Death, See Christ. This is really kind of the ultimate issue and opportunity for us as we live and move through our brief time here on earth. Before you see death, see Christ. That language comes from a promise that God by the Holy Spirit made to a man named Simeon. We're going to be reading about a man named Simeon. He's a a righteous man uh, living at the time when Jesus is born. And we're going to be reading about Simeon and his famous song and prophecy today. This is part two in a little two-part segment of our Luke series, Doxology at Dawn. Doxology at Dawn. We looked at Doxology at Dawn last week with recounting, of course, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and the Doxology of the Angelic Host. And now we look at Doxology coming through Um, a couple of people named uh, Simeon and Anna today who get to see baby Jesus when he first, his first time ever to the temple, first time ever to Jerusalem. But what I want you and me to focus on as we prepare to come to the Lord's table today is that we also have the opportunity in the gospel call to see Christ before we see death. We're all going to see death. It is guaranteed. It's 100%. You know, I'm not a statistician, but I can tell you pretty much everybody here, you and I, are going to die. It's one for one on that, or 100%, right? But not everybody sees Christ. Are you seeing Christ? Do you know him? Do you actually see him? When you pray to him, when you come to his table, are you in a living, seeing relationship with Jesus? I'm not talking about talking about Jesus. I'm talking about knowing him and seeing him. So that's the invitation today. The other thing that really is on my heart right now, it's been an issue. It's been a, you know, we deal with pandemics in different ways, not just something like COVID-19. We also deal with epidemics and pandemics of really corrosive, evil, spiritual warfare going on in our world, Uh, evil things happening. And I know that a lot of our young people, maybe older people too, but definitely our teenagers, even some of our pre-youth, some of our university students, and again, yeah, all the way through different uh, generations are addicted and their eyes, your eyes are addicted to things that you don't need to be seen yet you're called back to it addictively over and over again. And and Satan and the forces of destruction will use this not only to lead to death, as has happened in our own community and in our own schools in the last few months, but also ultimate destruction, the destroying of your soul, of my soul. So it really matters what you're seeing. I want you to reflect on that. Of course, in the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at children growing up and parenting as we move through Jesus's childhood. That'll be really a big focus, of course, the next couple weeks as we move through the last verses of chapter two of Luke. But I already want us to be thinking about this today because I know it is in front of us as as a big issue. Before you see death, whether you're 16 year old, 66 or 96, before you see death, you will see death, whether it comes when you're 16 or 66 or 96, the invitation of salvation is to see Christ. So uh, let's turn to our opening scriptures for today. Uh, Isaiah chapter 52, verses seven through 10, this oracle in a series of oracles from, uh, by God through the prophet Isaiah. They come right before the fourth and climactic servant song. And then our main scripture today, Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 39. Hear now God's word. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And you got four things here. Who announces peace, who brings glad tidings of good. The Hebrew there is tov, it's who announces salvation, who brings, who says to Zion, 
Your God reigns. In other words, the kingdom of God is here. Your God reigns. The voice of your watchman. I want you to pay attention to that language that was in the call to worship from the Psalms. It's a huge thing relating to Simeon. The voice of your watchman. They will lift up their voice. Together, they will sing for joy for eye to eye. Okay? Eye to eye. They will see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth, sing together. You waste places of Jerusalem, another foursome here, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and forth and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And now to Luke chapter 2, picking up at verse 22, following verse 21, with which we concluded the nativity story last week, with the circumcision and the naming of Jesus on the eighth day. Now, now, now we move further, to the 40th day, okay? And when the days for their purification were fulfilled according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus now, Mary and Joseph. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male first opening the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now behold... There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the anointed of the Lord. And he, Simeon, came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, this is Simeon, took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Now you are dismissing your servant, Master, according to your word in peace, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this one is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that out of many hearts, Thoughts may be revealed. And there was Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow, about 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, and coming up that very hour, she began confessing praise to God and was speaking of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to, into Galilee to their own town, Nazareth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Before you see death, may you see Christ. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he, before he would ever see death, he would be gifted, graced to see the Lord's Christ. From one of the great poetic works of literature of the 19th century, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Aurora Lee, which I commend to you. I mean, ma massive work, but in the midst of that, there is this passage that's astounding. There's nothing great or small has said a poet of our day. 
Earth's crammed with heaven. Do you hear that? Earth's, earth is crammed with heaven. And every common bush, a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries and daub their natural faces unaware. Jesus, to you, to me, to our teenagers, to everybody here, says this, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, when your eye is fixed on what it needs to be fixed on, when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, when your eye is in the wrong place, your body is full of darkness. And as we prepare to come to the Lord's table today, we are reminded through the Apostle Paul, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, without seeing and recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that Simeon, I mean, what a gift, would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ. So let's dig into this passage of Scripture from Luke to begin with. Luke uh, chapter 2, picking up at verse 22. Again, verse 21, the circumcision, the naming of Jesus, the Lord Savior, the Lord's salvation. Now, carrying on with the story. We're not at the eighth day. We're at the 40th day. Fulfillment continues. Fulfillment of what? I got a couple things here. You can fill in the blanks. If you know the answer, go ahead and put it in. Number one, fulfillment. Fulfillment of what? What is Luke focused on? The ESV and most translations seem to miss this a lot, so you're getting kind of Martin's translation a lot of times to highlight what, the, what Luke is actually saying in the Greek. The answer here is days. Luke is really, the Holy Spirit through Luke is really telling us days are being fulfilled. And that means like literal days, it also means epoch, okay? So the days are fulfilled. Let's just take a look at some of these scriptures. So our lead scripture for today that opens this passage, and when the days for their purification, I know the ESV says when the time came, I understand that, but <laughs> the actual literal language is when the days for their purification were fulfilled according to the law of Moses. Back to the closing verse from last week, verse 21, when eight days were fulfilled to circumcise him. Days. And uh, back to, of course, when Jesus is born. The King James Version gets it right. Most of the others don't tell us this. Uh, while they were there in Bethlehem, the days for her to give birth were fulfilled. The days are fulfilled. Um, we have not only the days, though, also we have something of Moses, otherwise known as something of the Lord. What would that be? The days are being fulfilled. Well, the days link over to something else. The law. The law. The instruction. The Torah. Um, the law of Moses. Sometimes Luke calls it that. More often he's going to call it the law of the Lord because Moses is just a, you know, pass through. Okay? <laughs> if, it's, if it's the real law, it's coming through Moses, but it's from God. So let's look at some of these verses. Um, and when the days for their purification were fulfilled, according to the law of Moses. Verse 23 from this same passage, next verse. As it is written in the law of the Lord. Okay? Every male opening the womb, firstborn, shall be called holy to the Lord. The next verse, verse 24. They came to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And then to close out this passage. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord. So we got the fulfillment being continued on the days and the law here. Everything's prophesied. This entire story is pointing to what is happening now, what we're being told. The whole Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament, everything is looking this way. 
Um, let's look at the little chiasm here in verses 22 through 24. Uh, notice you've got, first of all, you've got, on, on the one side, you've got the purifying of Mary and Joseph. Luke cryptically or interestingly says they, and he, he must be referring to Joseph who's been with Mary at the birth, you know, the whole, the, the blood, the whole thing, and uh, has been with her the whole time. So apparently it's being treated as not just Mary needs to be purified on the 40th day, but also uh, Joseph too. It's, I don't read this as Jesus. Jesus does not need this, okay? So um, Mary and Joseph. So a purifying of uh, their purification. Second part of side one here is the presenting of the firstborn. That's Jesus to the Lord as belonging to the Lord. This is under the law of the Lord. The firstborn male belongs to the Lord. And under the law, if he's not redeemed, he's subject to death. Okay. Now, on the other side of this chiasm, you've got the law. Luke is giving us the law on presenting the firstborn as holy to the Lord. That's Exodus 13. But there is no quotation of Numbers 18. And Luke does not mention a redemption price being paid, okay? There is no kippur. There's no, there's no ransom paid for Jesus as the firstborn to buy him back from the Lord under Numbers 18. I won't go here a whole lot today, but I do. I think it's important. Uh, Pastor Martin's interpretation of this passage, understanding that Luke is meticulous. I've just taken you, I've just worked you through several of these passages. Luke is meticulous in referring to law passages, telling you what's going on with the law, and telling you what happened, that they fulfill the law. He's silent on the redemption of the firstborn. I believe, most commentators say, well, obviously, it's just Luke forgot to tell us, but obviously it's happening all at the same time, so it happened then. They, they, made, they paid the redemption price for Jesus. I believe Luke would tell us that if it happened. These are poor people. We're going to see that in a minute. They have to do the two dural doves. Okay, they can't afford a lamb. I'll come back to that. They can't afford a lamb for Mary, okay? So they're poor, and I think Simeon and Hannah interrupt any possible redemption. And basically, exactly what Simeon's saying is, you don't need to pay a redemption price. He is the redeemer. He is the lamb. All of this scripture points to the fact that God himself will provide the lamb as God promised Abraham at Moriah when Abraham didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. You remember this? The Lord himself will provide the lamb. Here's the lamb. He just showed up. He will be back to the temple. Don't worry, he'll come back. He belongs to the Lord. You don't have to redeem him away from the temple. He belongs to the Lord, and he is the lamb. He's, the whole story is being fulfilled in him. So Luke does not tell us about a redemption price. There's no shekels paid here, okay? So we don't have numbers 18 quoted. We don't have a redemption payment. And then back to the final second side of this chiasm here. The law, Leviticus 12, is fulfilled for the mother and specifically the poor mother's version. You got a sin offering and a burnt offering. The burnt offering is supposed to be a lamb. But Leviticus provides, the law of the Lord provides that if the family cannot afford a lamb, you can do the turtle dove or pigeon version. So both the sin and the burnt offering, there are two different offerings being offered here, okay? Two sacrifices. Um, they go with the two turtle doves or the two pigeons. They're the poor people. And let's remember this when we talk about Jesus' upbringing in the last, next couple weeks. Jesus is a poor boy. Okay? He didn't have the swimming pools and the nice clothes. That is not Jesus. His mom and daddy cannot even afford a lamb for sacrifice at the highest you know, point of offering to the Lord. When Jesus is born, they got to go with the, the extra pigeon or the turtle dove. That's why they're on the cover of the, the bulletin. You're talking about poor people. Now, let's go on to 25 through 38. Just big picture, you've got two witnesses here. Two witnesses. Yeah, two witnesses. You've got Simeon and Hannah or Anna. Her name is actually Hannah, which means like grace or favor, Hannah. I'm not going to focus on her very much because we got to move on. She's the second of the two witnesses, but understand, again, 
uh, Luke is telling us Deuteronomy 18 is being fulfilled. You've got two witnesses to the Lord's coming. And, and let me repeat now, I know he's already come to Bethlehem, but this is the city, this is the holy city, and this is at the temple. This is Jesus' first appearance at the temple. Again, he will be back. I mean, he'll be back a number of times, and he will be back the ultimate time during Holy Week. We'll talk about that in a couple of months, okay? He will be back, okay? But this is the Lord's first visitation to the Father's house. And you get two witnesses on that. According to the law, you need two witnesses. You got them. And these are righteous, devout people. Simeon and Hannah, and they aren't any old witnesses. They're both under the Holy Spirit, witnesses. So by the way, the law says two or three witnesses. Who's the third witness? The Holy Spirit. Um, Ancient woman. She is advanced in years. We don't know if she's 84 or over 100. Luke's language here is kind of interesting. You heard the way I translated it, about 84. We don't know if that means 84 years from the time of her widowhood or that she's 84. She could be over 100. You understand what I'm saying? This is an ancient, devout woman. Even if she's in her 80s, I'm sorry, everybody, my, all my friends who are in your 80s, but you are, at that point, considered, according to the Bible, somewhat advanced in years. If you're over 100, you are definitely advanced in years. Um, she gives the testimony to those waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now let's go to the big story with Simeon, who's highlighted here. Um, Verses 25 through 26, we get the introduction of Simeon. He is the spirit-led man. He is the spirit-led man. You want a model? Go after Simeon. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. This is language from the prophets and from the Psalms. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's our focus for today. Now, verses 27 and 28, Simeon comes in something into the temple. What does he come in? Out of his own best wishes and optimism? Out of his own make it a great day slogan? Is that how he comes to the temple? No. How does he come to the temple? In the Spirit. We've already been told that the Spirit is upon him, that he's full of the Spirit, but this is even more intense language. You don't get this often in the Bible. It is not, this is rare now, when somebody is in the Spirit. And if they're in the Spirit, you're really supposed to be paying attention. This is prophetic language, okay? This is indicating his prophetic role. A Simeon comes in the Spirit, into the temple, opens his arms for Jesus. Get the sequence here. He's in the Spirit. Then he opens his arms for Jesus, and he blesses God. Just like we've been seeing in all these passages, it kind of surprises us because we thought the whole story was the baby. And in this case, you're talking about the very Son of God come in the flesh, so that's a pretty important baby, not just my grandchild or your daughter or whatever. Uh, But most people focus on babies instead of remembering to focus on God. So we're being told over and over again in the Bible, like the first person you praise is not the baby or the mama, it's God. Simeon comes in the spirit in the temple, opens his arms for Jesus, and blesses God. And then we get the song. Again, it's known as the Nuc Dimittis. Uh, Nuc Dimittis is just uh, now dismissed in, in Latin. Um, the, the, the Latin in Kippet line tags all four of the songs of Luke 1 and 2. And we, do, we are now at the fourth of the four famous songs. This is the most songy, psalmy, part of the entire New Testament, Luke 1 and 2, okay? So we've moved through now through all of them, right? Uh, Mary's Magnificat, Zechariah's Benedictus, the angelic host Gloria, okay? And Excelsis, and Excelsis, whichever way you like to pronounce your Latin. Um, and, and now, now the final one. And this one is climactic, it's, it's a big deal. Um, Simeon's song. It's a thanksgiving to the master, and the language is master. That's why I gave it to you in the translation up on the screen that way. The word there is not kurios, it's not lord, it's despata. It's, it's a, you know, the master of a servant. This is a thanksgiving to the master of a servant or a slave who is dismissed from his watch. He's been watching a long time. 
You ever had to watch for like 50 years, 60 years, 70 years for something? This is, you know, the Asbury revival that's going on right now. I hope you all are aware of this at Asbury University. People have been praying for that since 1970. Now, I'm not actually an expert on math or age or whatever, but I'm guessing if you've been praying since 1970 and you're still praying, you might not be what's called a spring chicken anymore. So there are people who prayed their whole life for this revival because the last one at Asbury was in 1970. And now you got a Gen Z version of it. Isn't that cool? So anyway, um, he's been waiting a long time. He's on the watch a long time, but now he's being dismissed because the watch is fulfilled. What he's had his eyes out for has now been seen. My eyes have seen your salvation. Are you watching? Is your life devoted to seeing and looking for what God wants you to see? His whole life, now he sees. I have seen, my eyes have seen your salvation. Um, 30 and 31, verses 30 and 31, the Lord has prepared his salvation. That's in other words, Jesus in the presence of all peoples, a light, a light for what? Two parts of this, a light for revelation to somebody, fill in the blank there, and for glory to your people, fill in the blank there. I hope you can get these answers right. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, to the nations, and for glory to your people, who's that? Israel, okay? <laughs> And Simeon's prophecy speaks to fulfilling the heart call of Isaiah's second servant song, okay? You got the four servant songs in Isaiah from, you know, Isaiah 42 running through Isaiah 53. The, the third and the fourth go to the suffering servant. Increasingly, we understand the servant's going to have to suffer, okay? But the second one really is the turning point, the, the the heart song here. And we also have this oracle from Isaiah chapter 52 that I'll come back to in a minute. We reread it to open. Powerful new calling in the second servant song. Isaiah, right here at the heart of the matter in uh, the pivot, uh, really of the gospel story in the Old Testament. Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. But now says the Lord, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to restore Jacob to him and, is, and that Israel might be gathered to him. So we're not talking about Israel as the son of the Lord, the adopted son of the Lord. We're talking about somebody who has to bring Israel back. Who is that going to be? I wonder which servant could restore Israel. For I will be glorified. Oh, this one's like going to be glorified like God in the eyes of God. I will be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God will be my strength. This is the servant. Now look at this. Next verse, verse 6. He said, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of, of Judah and the preserved of Israel to restore. Yeah, you're going to do that, but I got a lot more for you. I will make you a light to the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And now to the oracle. It's in a series of oracles leading up to the fourth servant song in which he is slain for our, you know, he's pierced for our transgressions. He pays the redemption price in the fourth, fourth servant song. Okay. So leading up to that, this oracle and this season of oracles here, um, 52, 7 through 10, the gospel messenger's feet arrive with a four-part gospel message. Peace, good tidings, salvation, and God's kingdom or God's reign. Verse 8, watchmen. Remember this? The watchman is a key thing. And their eyes are together. They're, all their eyes are on the same thing. Wouldn't that be beautiful Like when everybody like who's a, a real believer is actually seeing what's going on? Okay, So eye to eye, unified vision of the Lord's return to Zion. And then verses 9 and 10, Jerusalem sings for joy at the Lord's four-part comfort and redemption story. Four parts to this. The Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm. That means Jesus. Okay, he's manifested himself before the eyes of all the Gentiles, all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So on this bridge, connecting back to all of this, Simeon sings his song, and then he blesses the marveling parents, but he gives Mary a searing prophecy of Jesus being 
a contested sign, and of the large sword piercing her soul. He does not use small, small sword, like knife type, dagger kind of language. He uses, okay, big, broad, blunt sword. I mean, it's a rough sword. Before seeing death. Okay, so part of the thing what, what we have to understand about the prophecy to Mary, we'll dig into this more as we move towards Holy Week. But you know what? If you see Jesus, if you love Jesus, it's not always easy. Okay, Jesus has to go through suffering. He has to redeem us as the lamb, you understand he's slain for your salvation, right? The lamb is slain. And then he says, if you would come with me, you need also to take up your cross and follow me. That's what Simeon is saying to Mary here. Sword, he, he's going to be a sign that exposes whether people are saved or not. Okay? And the language here for the rising is anastasis. It's, 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 it's resurrection language. He's destined for the fall, in other words, all the way to hell, or the resurrection of a whole lot of people because he is the light that exposes. He's the light that exposes. But you know what? It's going to be hard for you because you're going to see him contested and you're going to see what he goes through to bring us to this table. So finally, as we prepare to come to the table before seeing death, how do we see Jesus? Just four notes here. Number one, be spirit-led. That's not something you and I can produce on ourselves. It's what we yield to. I don't say, I'm going to get up today and really be spiritual. That's not, you can say that, but it's not going to work well. Okay? It's yielding to the Holy Spirit, yielding to the voice of God waiting and watching. We don't like to wait. Can I pull it up on my cell phone right now? No. Wait for the Lord. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Number two, along those lines, be open to God's call, God's interruptions. But I got ball games to go to. I got this thing to do. I got to get this done. I got to get this paper in. Yeah, I know. Calm down a little bit. Allow God to interrupt you and call you to himself. Number three, open my something and something. The answers here are open my heart and my eyes. Heart, eyes, real important dynamic there. Where my eyes are, that's where my heart's gonna end up. Where my heart is, that's where my eyes are gonna wander. And then fourth, open my just like Simeon did, arms and hands to Jesus and to serving Jesus. Are your arms open to Jesus? If you see him, I invite you to embrace him and serve him. Before you see death, see Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.